Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for being here. You're all very welcome to this evening's, or to the third Young Professional Network this e event this evening. Um, it's the first one I'm chairing, so if you hear my voice shake, that is why. Um, my name is Tara. I am one of the researchers here at the Institute. I focus on development and also on the European Union. But more importantly, I am delighted to be joined by Sally Hayden, an award-winning journalist and photographer who focuses on migration, conflict, and humanitarian crises. So uh, we will talk today a bit about seeking refuge on the central Mediterranean, also known as the world's deadliest migration route. Um, but before I introduce you properly, I'm just going to give the format of this evening. So um, Sally and I are going to talk about uh, a bit for 25, 20, 25 minutes. I will ask her a few questions of my own. That will hopefully provide um, like a summary for the audience to understand a bit more about the nature of her work and what exactly is going on in the Mediterranean Sea. And we will discuss the movement of refugees and migrants there, um, how they're being treated on the way to Europe, um, and then also how institutions like the European Union, the United Nations have responded to the migration crisis. And then we will move on to the Q&A session where um, you will be able to ask some questions. Okay, now Sally, I will introduce you very quickly. Um, so <laughs> you are an award-winning journalist and photographer. You have worked for, just to give you an idea, CNN, Time, BBC, The Irish Times, The Guardian, The New York Times, Al Jazeera, many, many more. Um, you have also reported extensively from all across Africa, the Middle East, Europe, I think also a bit in North America, other parts of Asia. Um, and I suppose important for this chat, you wrote um, this book, yeah, My Fourth Time We Drowned, uh, Seeking Refuge on the World's Deadliest Migration Route. Um, this was published in 2022. It has been translated, I think, into five, is it different languages? Four or five? Um, yeah, something yeah, like something that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it has won a lot of awards, one of which is the On Post Irish Book of the Year Award. So we have that out of the way. Um, I'm going to start off with um, a simpler question for you, Sally, which is how did you get into journalism in the first place? And maybe why do you focus specifically on conflict, humanitarian crises, um, migration? OK. Um how do, I, I mean, I can give you like a longer answer or a shorter answer. <laughs> Whichever you prefer, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I was generally interested in journalism, but I just didn't know any journalists, if that makes sense. So um, like now, as you, I'm sure lots of people here, you like look back and you're like, oh, it makes sense that I've ended up doing this. You know, like I was watching the news a lot when I was young. Um, when I was in fifth class in school, we set up like the, I went to a school called Our, called Our Ladies Grove. We set up mm -hmm. the Grove Gazette newsletter. And um, yeah, in transition year, I got, a, sorry, I won like a, a word from the Irish Star. So like you had to write an essay and um, the prize was like a week's work experience on a camera. So I went in there and did that. Um, I mean, it wasn't really what I wanted to do in terms of journalism, even though I couldn't verbalize that. It was like, you know, write about Brian McFadden wearing a lot of green and, you know, come up with like slogans like green, of, green with envy to describe it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of puns as well. So, but I did that and it kind of gave me some little insight. And then when I went to college, I studied law, um, which I do think actually is relevant because it's like learning about how the world works. Like I was always really interested, you know, I was one of these kids who's like, but why, but why? And um, yeah, I wanted to understand how the world works and generally just, yeah, that was, so I did law. Um, and I started writing for the student newspaper around second year. And I was like really shy as well, by the way. So I was like, you know, I don't know, like I was scared to approach them in first year. That's why I never wrote in first year. And then in second year, I was like, please, will you let me go and do, um, you know, anything? And they 
sent me off to do music interviews. And basically, I became the person who would always say yes. So it was like, you know, can you go and interview Riz or Kicks today in this place? And I'd be like, yes, and just like skip class and go and do it, <laughs> which obviously isn't always advisable. But um, because of that, they gave me lots of opportunities. And then I started applying both for law jobs and for journalism internships. And I remember like it was kind of a case of, I hadn't fully realized that I could do the thing I wanted to do. So um, when I was going to, you know, corporate legal internship interviews, mm -hmm. they'd be like, why do you want to be a corporate lawyer? And I'd be like, I don't know, but I really want to do it. And they'd be like, you obviously don't. You want to be a journalist. <laughs> like everything on your CV is related to journalism. But um, yeah, so I got none of those internships and ended up getting... I think I did one with BBC. I did a one week's work, one month's work experience with BBC uh, right after I graduated my degree. I also did a J1, um, which I'm sure people here have done, and went to California and lived, you know, nine of us in a two bedroom apartment, like on uh, air beds. But I'm, while I was there, I emailed the local newspaper and said, can I do work experience? And they said, yes. So I ended up through the Santa Barbara Independent reporting on a murder trial, which was like very, you know, scary. <laughs> um, not because of, you know, I didn't feel personally scared, but just intimidated. And also I had kept having to call people on the phone and they'd be like not understanding my accent. And the editor was really keen on, you know, you must learn to call people and not be afraid. And I'd call up and they'd be like, I don't understand you. <laughs> Send me an email. <laughs> so that was very embarrassing, but also I guess was kind of broke down some of those walls of fear. Um, and anyway, this is the long version, by the way. Um, I then got a, I applied for the Simon Cumber scheme, yeah. which is Irish Aid funded, actually. And, sorry? I didn't say that, uh, for the, give it the journalist opportunity. In Simon Cumber's? Yeah, I know, I know about that. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay, yes, um, yeah, exactly. So it's basically, I think it's just reopened, by the way. So if anyone is a student, you can probably apply for it and there's a professional version and I applied for the student version so it's basically funding for at that time three students to go to a developing country um, and report on a specific issue generally one that Irish aid is interested in um, and you got mentoring from a different national media outlet so I applied I looked up you know I didn't know anything but I was like what are their topics they're interested in and they said gender equality and that was one and then I looked up the different countries the nine Irish aid partner countries they were called at that time one was Malawi and Malawi had just got its first female president so I was like well that would be an interesting story like how has having a female president changed you know women's lives if at all and so I said I'd interview you know four different women and from different backgrounds and just spend time with them and ask them has this made any difference at all or mm. you know what do you think about it and it was a very basic idea but I won uh, the print version got mentoring from the Irish Times and that meant that they gave me this chunk of money that they said you know this is to pay for you to go to Malawi for I think I was meant to go for like a week and you know stay in a hotel and I was like screw that like I'm gonna go for as long as I possibly can and just live somewhere much much cheaper and do everything really cheaply so I went there, I found a room, a spare room in someone's house that I could rent for much cheaper. I only got public transport around. Um, I just spent a lot of time like thinking that I was a journalist, but also not being a journalist because I had no idea how to be a journalist. Um, trying to write one story, which is ridiculous. Now I know like as a journalist, you don't get six weeks. I end up saying just six weeks, but you don't get six weeks to write one story generally. And... I did things like, you know, I'd go down to the local market and I'd just sit with the people who sell things there and we'd play this game called Bow, um, which I can't remember exactly, but I think it's a bit like checkers and, you know, they'd tell me all the gossip and then I also had to post on social media um, 
part of the Simon Cumbries at the time was they were like, can you post things on social media to publicize basically your work in the scheme? So I didn't really use Twitter at the time, but I was like tweeting, you know, I'm in Malawi, I'm an international journalist, which I like wasn't publishing anything, but anyway, no one noticed. So I started getting contacted by people like a presidential candidate um, who was running for the next presidential election, like Malawi's top hip hop artist. Uh, and they would be like, let's meet up. You know, I hear you're an international journalist and you've come, to, you've come to our country. So I ended up just saying yes again to everybody and meeting them all. I mean, safety wise, I don't know if that's always a great idea, but at that time I was just very excitable. So um, yeah, and basically what happened, what transpired was that there was a big corruption scandal. So I had been kind of living this life telling everyone I'm an international journalist. And then there was a scandal where a lot of politicians were found with huge stacks of cash in their boots and like loads of other places. And it, it's called Cash Gate. Um, this was 2013. It kind of blew up. And then I had a situation where somebody told me that the budget director for the government was going to be shot, potentially going to be assassinated. And then he actually was. <laughs> this actually isn't funny, by the way, but don't worry, he doesn't die. He actually was shot. Um, and I was like terrified because I was suddenly like, I, I thought, you know, I t I'm here telling everyone I'm a journalist. Things have got really real and I can't even get anything published because I don't know how to do that. And like, I was like sending emails to like the New York Times editor being like, hello, I'm a journalist in Malawi. Like I'm in the middle of this corruption scandal. Can you publish my article? And obviously no one responds. Um, so anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up leaving Malawi eventually, uh, came to, um, came to back to Ireland. Uh, I was working as a Christmas elf in <laughs> Grafton Street at one point, um, and in the Odeon as a cocktail waitress and also writing up my one, I think in the end it was two stories that I had reported in the six weeks for the Irish Times. And I got, I applied for an internship with CNN and basically this, I'll end this story, even though it's obviously much longer, but this, I think it's interesting because it's Young Professional Network. Um, I, yeah, applied for this uh, CNN internship and when the anchors there, Becky Anderson called me and she was like, 80 people applied for this internship you know, we're interviewing, I don't know, 23 people will be chosen or four people will be chosen. Why should I pick you? Um, you know, you're going to have the next however many minutes to convince me. And I answered all of her questions about actual news very, very badly. And then when she actually said this straight up, like, why do you want this job? I started babbling about this corruption scandal and being in Malawi and realizing the really importance of like accurate information when you're in a time of you know, political crisis and how people there were saying, we don't know what to trust because, you know, there's a lot of corruption even within the media because nobody has funding for journalism. And I gave this very long answer and she said, okay, like that's fair. I was like, I just want to learn how to be a journalist. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, okay, that's a good answer. So um, they took me on in CNN. I went from there to the Financial Times. Um, interning and fact-checking and then from there I got a job in Vice News for two years in London where I was like a general kind of I was basically covering all international news except for America because <laughs> we had people there and that was a good experience in some ways and really terrible in others um, yeah I'm sure people know what has happened to Vice since uh, but yeah, like it, they had a team of like very young, passionate people who were like really just caring about the world. And for me, you know, I feel like sometimes when you're growing up, it can be like if you're enthusiastic about something, you feel like you have to temper that. And I was suddenly in this place where it was like everybody really just like cared about what they were doing and and was very obsessive about it. And that was very exciting. And so since 2016, I've been freelance. Um, I'm on contract for the Irish Times since 2021, uh, but I've been working pretty steadily for them, but I also work for other people. And uh, then I wrote this book um, and I'm working on a, another book right now, which I don't want to talk about. Okay, fair enough. Um, that was great, thank you. <laughs> Basically, um, fake it till you make it, but also 
just be passionate and it'll work out kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say faking because I was actually in Malawi on a, <laughs> like I, I was actually in Malawi on an assignment. But yeah, I think like, be careful what title you give yourself <laughs> if you, um, yeah, if you end up in a crisis. And I think what I really learned as well, it's like actually not like, you really need to start from the bottom in some, in some ways you need to be brave and, and care about things and go after what you think is important. But in another way, like there's nothing wrong with spending time getting your fundamentals in order mm. because like I always say to people who want to be journalists, like don't be really pushing to be at the top very quickly because if you make like a mistake or you don't know how to handle a situation, you know, that can be very scary and even, you know, affect your career forever. Mm. Like you really want to, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky to say, but I think I realized in Malawi, like I realized the importance of actually being the person at the bottom, watching other people make those decisions and seeing how they manage stressful situations. And, you know, in CNN, my job was like largely burning CDs and like, taking people to the green room and taking them to get their makeup and making coffee. But at the same stage, I was in meetings where I watched people make, like Christiane Amanpour's show I worked on, like I watched her and her team go, what's gonna be our big story on air? What questions are we gonna ask to, you know, the prime minister of this country or, you know, the rebel leader of wherever. And, and seeing that is actually very, valuable. Like you have to respect the people who have experience as well. So yeah, you need a balance of be brave and go at your own and also like, yeah, learn from others. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, you mentioned your book and obviously I do want to talk a bit about the book. Um, for those that haven't read it, um, I kind of, I want everyone to really understand like the true story of the refugee crisis, the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. Could you tell us why you wrote the book or how you got about writing the book and then also kind of a short summary of what you wrote in the book. Yes, um, I mean, ideally people will read the book and yes. they can get all of the answers to all of those questions from it. But um, in the meantime, sorry, Catherine's written books, so she knows. Um, yeah, I think, what did I write? Why did I write the book? What's in the book? Um, so basically I had been reporting on, when I worked for Vice, like I said, I was covering everything, which like I don't recommend like it was very stressful and yeah every day we'd be like what's the big story and a lot of it was desk work so like you're sitting in a desk in London um you know journalists always want to be out and about talking to people they don't want to be sitting at a desk kind of looking at press releases and rewriting wire you know news wires and all of this um and I basically was desperate to just go out and do anything. So it wasn't that I wanted to report on migration specifically, but I was like, you know, like I would have reported on anything. And uh, we were in, uh, in Vice in August, August 2015. And um, my, it, it was when a lot of people were trying to cross from Calais in France to, to the UK. And that was making a lot of headlines. And David Cameron, who was prime minister at the time, came out and said, you know, there are swarms of migrants trying to get here. And like me and my editor were like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> like, like, who are these people? Why are they trying to come? Like, what, like, what does that mean? I don't understand that, that phrase at all. So I was like, well, just send me. I'm going to find that out. If you send me to Calais, I'll figure out what's going on. And he said, OK, fine, you can go. And so Vice had given me like, I think like a thousand business cards, um, which I hadn't really got that much chance to use. So I was like, I'm going to take like a big load of my business cards with me and went out to Cali with a photographer as well. And we went around and just talked to everybody. We were like, you know, exactly why are you here? What, why do you want to go to the UK? Where did you come from? Like, what should we know? Um, some people didn't want to talk. And then I'd give them a business card and go, well, that's my details. You know, that's my name. You can look me up. A lot of them knew Vice, which was quite handy. So they'd be like, oh, yeah, Vice, um, and talk to me. And generally, like, it was just, it, it, it was like, 
you were meeting people from all over the world who had loads and loads of different reasons for why they were trying to come to UK. You know, some had family members, some spoke English, some uh, had been promised potential jobs. Like there were people who had many, many reasons and they had fled countries all over Africa, the Middle East, Asia. Um, yeah, so it wasn't this homogenous mass of people that it's it's kind of being portrayed as in the media and politically. And what happened was I gave loads of people my cards. I said, contact me if you get to the UK, we can maybe meet up. And there were a few people who did make it. Um, and I'm sure more made it, but there were a few who made it and contacted me. And one of those... Uh, Sorry, this is like a very long answer again. <laughs> so I'll cut part of the story. But um, but basically, the, from leads that I got from that time, I ended up doing various other migration-related investigations. So like one thing I tried to tell to say to people, rather than being like, you know, asking just the questions that I think are important, I say, what do you think is important? What do, what don't you think is being covered? What do you think the media is missing? Like. What do you feel like, um, you know, yeah, what's, what's misunderstood? Like, let me know what we should be reporting. And the things that people tell you are often like not what you would anticipate. And so I ended up doing one big investigation out of that with someone who I met in Calais who then became a journalist because he had met so many, he's called Ziad Gantor, he met so many journalists on his way to the UK that he was like, oh, that seems like a good job. Like, I guess I'll also be one. And he's now very successful in BBC, by the way. So we ended up t teaming up doing an investigation about people, Syrians who had reached Europe, who were then trying to return to Syria. And... Um, yeah, he, we then that investigation like won some awards and stuff. Um, the EU, EU European Migration Media Awards got first prize in that. Um, but also it was used in legal challenges. So I was like asked to go to Berlin and testify in a case against the German government, like about um, the status that was given to Syrian refugees, specifically like young males. And it was my first experience of like, you can, your reporting can be used in these many other ways, like not just how you would anticipate. And um, yeah, it was also, by the way, the first Irish Times uh, article published in Arabic, because we were like, we want it to be published in Arabic as well, so that Syrians can read it. And um, yeah, I think the only Irish Times article ever published in Arabic as well. Um, I hope it's still on the website. So he, yeah, so after that I got, I then went to Sudan, did another investigation into UNHCR corruption, the UN Refugee Agency, um, corruption in the resettlement scheme. That again came from meeting refugees who were in Khartoum and saying, what should we be reporting? And they were like, you know, you think you're reporting this, but actually you should be reporting this. And I did this investigation. Um, UNHCR found one, eventually one staff member guilty of soliciting bribes and abusing power. Um, and the allegations were that staff were taking bribes of like tens of thousands of dollars from refugees in Khartoum or in Sudan to move them to Western countries. So, you know, you have the refugee resettlement schemes are meant to be for the most vulnerable people. I mean, it's always debatable how you define that, but um, instead, there were uh, like there are widespread allegations of corruption. It was proven in this case, so I can't say corruption. Um, but sorry, very long answer. That that investigation was why this book started. So this book starts with a Facebook message that I got in 2018, and it said, "Hi, Sister Sally, we need your help. We're under bad condition in Libya prison. If you have time, I'll tell you all the story." And it came from someone who was in a detention center in Libya. Um, a war had just broken out. And so basically there were hundreds of people. Uh, they had tried to reach Europe across the Mediterranean Sea. They had been caught by the Libyan Coast Guard. It turned out as a direct result of EU policy. Um, so what Europe has been doing since 2017 is carrying out surveillance to spot boats of people who are trying to cross into Europe. <coughs> and giving that information to the Libyan Coast Guard or so-called Libyan Coast Guard, because it's kind of like a collection of militias. But um, 
they then intercept the boats. And so this is a circumnavigation of international law, basically, because a European vessel can't push people back to Libya, but a Libyan vessel can. And so these people had tried to cross to Europe. They were caught at sea. They were forced back, locked up indefinitely, no charge or trial. Um, and they're just locked up in these detention centers. And they had you know, been abused in various different ways for months. And then a war had broken out around them. So the guards who were guarding them suddenly ran away. They didn't know why. They didn't know what they're meant to do. They had no food, like no water. They were just like, you know, abandoned. And so at that point, they contacted me and they said, they started explaining all of this. And I was like, obviously, you know, I was in London at the time. I was quite hungover. <laughs> I was watching Netflix. I was like, you know, this Facebook message came and I was like, like, is this real? Like, I don't really, I wasn't taking it too seriously, but I was like, okay, I guess I should respond. Um, so I said, you know, I'm a journalist. I can't help you probably, but, um, but yeah, you can give me more information. We can talk for a bit if you want to. And they, uh, the, the man who was messaging me then said, you know, told me all this story. What I realized, like I said, was that they were there as a direct result of European Union policy, but also they were in a life or death situation. And so I started contacting everyone I could think of. I contacted the UN, I contacted NGOs, um, and eventually I started posting on Twitter screenshots of their messages. So I was like, you know, as freelance journalist, uh, you can't necessarily get something published very fast. I think it was also a Sunday, which can be a tricky time to get things published. Um, and so I had, I emailed my editors, I'm pretty certain, and said, you know, I think this is a story, but I also then started posting on Twitter saying, I've been receiving these messages, these people seem to be in danger, you know, obviously they had approved me to do this as well. Um, and so that, that's where the book starts with those messages. What transpired was that I thought that this was one group of people that they just needed help and you know, once they were helped, this whole thing would be over and it must be a mistake and maybe the war had started so suddenly. Um, what actually happened was that I ended up with my contact details passed around many different detention centers. My tweets like, were seen by many, many people working in this field. I ended up being contacted by loads of boats, you know, people who were detained in detention centers and their family members but also many of the people who were working in NGOs and in diplomats as well, um, in various aspects of what it turned out was like a big system of abuse um, and a big cycle of abuse that people were trapped in and an EU sanctioned cycle of abuse. And that was what I then spent like years documenting. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, it's much better explained in the book than it is by me here. Um, and I've been told it's quite readable, so it might sound dense, but it also is, yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, easier to understand it that way. It is very readable, it is. <laughs> um, staying with the EU, I want to talk then a bit about Rwanda, and I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, you write in your book about how um, certain wealthy countries um, fund developing countries like Rwanda to take in um, refugees instead of them coming you know, to Europe, for example. And I think we all know that a familiar case at the moment is the UK planning to deport people to Rwanda. Um, do you have... You, I, th um, I think you have contacts with people in the UK who may get deported, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we're waiting to see what happens right now with the election, because I think Rishi Sunak is saying there won't be deportations before the election, and Labour are saying they'll drop the plan if they're elected. Um, so I guess we're waiting to see. Yeah, there's one chapter in the book on Rwanda, and I mean, now it feels like a bit prescient that I included that, because mm -hmm. the... Um, initial version of the book was finished, I think, before the Rwanda deal and this paperback that you have has an update where I talk about it. Um, the book and my reporting was actually used in the legal challenge against the UK Home Office. Um, and so my reporting was on the EU funded uh, evacuation scheme that brings people from, sorry, it brings people from uh, Libya to Rwanda, but then on to other countries. So they kind of go through the asylum process in Rwanda. Um, and then 
move on. But the UK Home Office used that as kind of evidence. I mean, you can hear them all the time. They kind of mischaracterize it, but um, they use that as evidence that, you know, Rwanda is a good country and, you know, UNHCR already works with it. The EU already works with it. So they should send people there. And so my experience reporting there was, um, I've reported there three times, I think, and I tried to go there again. Uh, I don't know if you saw that in March yeah. and was not allowed to board the plane. So it seems like I'm banned, um, though nobody has told me that officially. But basically when I went to board the plane this time, um, I kind of noticed like four people looking, like passing around my passport and shaking their heads, like the airline staff at the gate. And then they said, the Rwandan authorities had emailed them and said, I'm not allowed to board the plane to Kigali, the capital. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. There, I mean, yeah, there, again, there's a whole chapter in the book on that. Hopefully people read it. Um, that talks about what I found when I was reporting there. And I didn't report like any major scandal. I reported on one thing that I think is the reason I'm banned, though I haven't been told, which was about an allegation of attempted sexual assault against a minor in a refugee, in this refugee transit camp. And I reported that only after, like I had actually been told, because I was in communication with people in the camp even when I wasn't in the country. Um, I was told about that by people in the camp and they were trying to get just an investigation because the person accused of it was still in the camp. He was working with the police. He was there, you know, every day. They basically released a list of demands. They were like, we want you and HCR to have a presence here. We want, you know, it was various things to make them feel more safe when they were in this camp. Um, and instead, the Rwandan police came out on Twitter, actually, and said that this boy was lying. And... Then I published a story basically summarizing everything that had happened and that there hadn't been an investigation and that he was still there. And then the Rwandan uh, president spokesperson came out on also on Twitter, a lot happens on Twitter, um, and said that I write refugee porn and that I was using this case to further my career. Um, and then the government associated newspaper, the New Times, wrote an art or published an article saying that I peddle lies and repeating this refugee porn quote. And uh, yeah, so I think that was why I am no longer yeah. allowed to Safe get to planes say. to Rwanda. But yeah. um, I haven't tried the land border yet, so <laughs> there's still hope. <laughs> there's still hope. Um, I'm just, I'm conscious of time. I think so I can have the audience ask you a few questions as well, because I'm sure they want to. I will ask you one more of my own, and then we can go to the audience. Um, so the book focuses on Libya. But since then, uh, I believe it is Tunisia that is the most popular uh, point of departure for people who want to get to Europe. Um, you have reported a lot from Tunisia, but also now from Lebanon. Only once from Tunisia. Oh, once from yeah. Tunisia, and then now from Lebanon, correct? And I'm not really reporting in Lebanon, I'm just living there. Okay, right. That's a, that's a mistake <laughs> on my part. Um, the EU has funded, has given a billion euro to both countries, Tunisia and Lebanon, to kind of stop migrants from entering Europe. Is that correct? Yeah. And, um, or like they've done deals, I don't know how much I think it's been. a billion, yeah. Um, I suppose, what have you seen there um, and... Do you think this is like an indication that the EU will basically stop at no cost to, to stop migrants from coming in, which I suppose is maybe a bit like a double standard considering at the exact same time we have taken in millions of Ukrainian refugees? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot in that question, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I think like what I would really encourage people to do is consider, and one thing that I, by the way, like as a journalist, you write kind of short articles and you tend to follow formulas in a certain way and you don't get a lot of time to sit back and go, wait a second, like, what about the framing of this discussion? What about the words that I'm using? Like, um, writing a book gave me the chance to do that. And I think, there's a lot of the terminology, there's a lot of the way this is spoken out about that is just kind of a slightly, it's kind of wrong. Like even the term you're saying migration crisis, like yeah. actually like I think what we have is a global inequality crisis and we have a lot of countries with their own crises. Like 
whereas like when you say migration crisis, it's kind of ignoring that, you know, in Sudan, for example, now we have 10 million internally displaced by war um, since April 2024. You know, that's not a migration crisis. That's a, a crisis of war and a humanitarian mm. crisis for Sudanese people. Um, so nearly two million now have left the borders. But again, like, you know, it's not Europe's crisis so much as it's their crisis, yeah, yeah, if that okay. makes sense. Um, Tunisia, I went there last year. It's now the most common, I think still, but maybe double check that. Um, it, be, it overtook anyway Libya as the most common departure point. And there again, like I went out there, I was meeting people from all over Africa, even some from Asia, who had again fled loads of different things. And so, you know, again, we're using this word migrants, but it's not a homogenous group of people. You know, migrants is obviously a descriptor, refugee is a legal status, but these are just people. Um, you know, like, like us, and I feel like I repeat this over and over again, like people with hopes and dreams, people with family members. Um, and the way that it's spoken about is, again, like this is a homogenous group, but also it's dehumanizing in that it kind of allows abuses to happen or overlooks the fact that so many people are dying even because, um, because of this terminology, I think. You know, if you heard that a boat of tourists had drowned in the Mediterranean, you'd be like, oh, there must have been why there must have been a rescue launched. But if you hear about of migrants, you're like, oh yeah, that's normal. And I wrote an article for the New York Times actually right after the trip to Tunisia. And the headline that um, I think I gave it, but they certainly gave it was mass death becomes normalized. And they put it on their front page. And I was like, that is how Europe that, that is really the story for me now, but also am I now normalizing it even more by saying it has become normalized? Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, what was the end of your question about Ukraine? Uh, just, yeah, no, just is there a bit of a double standard there that, you know, we as Europeans or as a European Union fund... Oh, funding countries. Yeah, and then at the same time, when it comes to Ukrainian refugees, I mean, everyone has the right to claim asylum, so I'm not saying Ukrainians shouldn't, but I'm just saying that it's interesting how we fund some people to make sure they don't come in, and yet we happily accept other groups. Yeah, I mean, I think that no matter how you feel about migration, which, yeah, I mean, is a very simplistic phrase mm. in itself that's not really fair to reality, but... Um, the EU is spending huge sums of money, like like incomprehensible sums of money <laughs> in ways that are kind of short term trying to stop migration from certain countries or certain areas. But from my reporting, I would see that they're actually contributing to destabilization. They're propping up authoritarian regimes. They're propping up militias, warlords, dictatorships. Tunisia, you know, you have Kais Saeed, who's accused of being increasingly authoritarian. He had actually unleashed hate speech against black Africans right before the EU did this deal. He, you know, I met people there. They had had jobs, long-term jobs. They had had accommodation. They were evicted. They were, um, you know, fired from their jobs and they felt like they had no choice to go to Europe because of the hate speech he had unleashed. Mm -hmm. And right after that, you have Ursula van der Leyen and Mark Rutte from Netherlands and Georgia Maloney, like standing with him and going, Team Europe, you know. Um, we're doing a billion billion euro deal with him. And in Lebanon, I mean, I'm sure people know the country is very dysfunctional. There's, you know, a lot of corruption. There's a terrible economic crisis. Um, and people there feel like EU aid like, should be contingent on economic reforms. A lot of citizens would feel that. And instead, it's now potentially being given unconditionally because they want to stop migration. And actually, again, in the long term, are you not contributing to the destabilization? And you're, you're increasing the, re the systems that oppress people, you know? Securitization, it's the same. It's increasing the systems that oppress people. And actually, in the book, there's a part where I go out on a rescue ship, and I had, in the Mediterranean, I had thought that we were going to, you know, just assume that we're going to rescue people from other parts of Africa. And instead, the people came, who came on board were Libyans. And they said, we're fleeing these militias because the militias now are so powerful and so terrifying that we can't live in Libya anymore. And as my book shows, like militias are again being empowered by EU anti-migration funding. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Sally. Um, and also, thank you for reminding us to check our language, you know. Um, 
I'm, and, by, and by the way, like I'm always questioning my own no, use of no, language. But like for me, also it's a work in progress. Yeah. I, I feel like we all need to be self-reflective about these things, and it's not like I'll be like, you should use this word and not that word. But I do think that, yeah, I think we all need to be constantly kind of thinking, am I contributing to, you know, to bad framing of this mm -hmm. or dehumanization or, yeah, how is this? what role am I playing in this as well, particularly as journalists, because I think the media has done a lot to kind of yeah. perpetuate certain framings. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll go to Q&A now. Um, oh yeah, I see hands already. Um, just, yeah, over there again. I wish I had brushed my hair if I knew it was <laughs> no, you being look filmed. <laughs> Hi. Um, is it on? If you oh. want to just uh, stand up, just so, yeah. Uh, hi, I um, have done quite a bit of work with kind of grassroots organizations in, in Calais mostly, but also in on the Serbian border. And one thing I find there is that there's a real mistrust with um, people on the move, but also with grassroots organizations of the media. I was just wondering how you kind of navigate that and how you feel that the, the relationship between all three parties can kind of be improved that way. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I mean, to be honest, like I also mistrust lots of media, so I understand. I do think that there are lots of journalists who are trying to do the absolute best they can. And I think sometimes, you know, media budgets are being cut. People don't always have the expenses or the, or the support to go out and do certain types of reporting. Um, also, like editors, like editors look at what gets the most clicks and a lot of the time they won't commission stories on these types of things because they're like, well, nobody will read it. And, you know, when I talk to audiences, I say, please, like, read these stories because the editors will notice if more people are interested in the topic and they'll commission more. Um, I think that some, some of the problem does come from people just sitting at desks and, you know, kind of regurgitating certain, you know, it's easy to get a statement from anyone powerful, basically. Um, I can easily get a statement from a politician from my desk and just rewrite it. And it's hard to go out and talk to people who are anxious about speaking. You know, you have to spend a bit of time with them. Um, you know, they might want to be anonymous as well, which is understandable in a lot of cases. Uh, I haven't really had major problems with this trust but I think I don't really force anyone to talk to me so I'll be like you know like I said give someone your contact detail give them your card they can contact you after they do their research on you um, and yeah I think I but yeah I don't know it's it's a bit of a tricky one and at the same stage like we do we need more and more voices of particularly like you know, refugees, like I hate, I'm saying the word migrants after I said don't say it, but you know, like people making journeys, people on the move, the more voices we have, the better. Um, and at the same stage, it's very, the whole system is set up to keep people quiet. Like it's set up that people will be dealing with a lot of trauma. They'll know anything they say can be used against them. If you're going through an asylum system, you know, you really learn to be quite quiet because you don't know what you could say that could suddenly be the one thing that they'll be like, oh, you know, like Eritreans, for example, were telling me they've had forced military service, but they can be told, you know, you can't guess certain protections because you've been in the military, but they're like, but it, it was forced, you know, I didn't have a choice in that, but that might make them not eligible for certain things. Um, so yeah, I think, I guess being patient and also to be honest, my book couldn't have been written if I was only interviewing people after the fact. Like the only reason that I had all this information was that we were all in touch while the thing was going on. Um, I think to to speak to people after the fact, it can be, they really, a lot of people want to forget that they've been through this. It's like, do you want to be defined by the worst thing that's ever happened to you or do you want to then move on with your life? And I think letting people engage with that in the way that they want to can also be best like I have a friend for example who's Syrian who like said I think he started like a comedy podcast about being a refugee but he was like you know this is how I want to deal with this topic and and I want to do it on my terms and I want to do it as like a joke and I was like that's great like <laughs> why not do that so yeah also some of the problem with the media I guess is that people don't want to be seen as victims and you're kind of putting they feel like they're put in that position by speaking to you and I understand that and at the same stage knowing what has happened is really important so and um, that's not a perfect answer but, but thanks for your work <laughs> uh, any more questions
Oh, yeah, down there. I see there's a question down there. Uh, sorry, if you could just say your name as well um, and affiliation, just so. Yeah, my name is Neve, and I work with the National Youth Council of Ireland and also Glen Cree Peace and Reconciliation Centre, um, and I do some other work as well. But my um, question is, oh, I wrote it down so that it would be succinct. Um, yeah, it's essentially, so thank you, Sally, but uh, do you know any voices within Europe that are publicly speaking out against racist immigration policies so that we could highlight some of these apart from your own voice and the work that you're doing? Just kind of, as you said, it's like a, the system is more built for silence than it is for, for voice, and I think that kind of, it's hard in, in some of the work that I'm doing, I'm trying to kind of draw on those voices to highlight to other people, like, look, there is an alternative, especially around the EU migration pact and things like that, but there is, I can't seem to, like, find them that easily, you know, just wondering in your research or in kind of even, like, uh, ideally, it would be people within positions of power because I recognize grassroots organizations like Frontline Defenders and things like that are doing that work. Um, but I, in that kind of wider sphere of like, yeah, p politics and maybe like even with NGOs, I don't see it as much apart from kind of grassroots organizations. So just wondering, is it maybe behind closed doors only or is there some people who are, you know, recognize all of the things that you highlight in your book and things that I can see in my research, which is around like the blatant racism in policies and also what you highlight all the time, which is like kind of the ongoing um, like waste of money towards uh, propping up like colonial structures and not putting money into investing in decolonial work and basically like s managing systems of mobilization in a way that makes sense for people because people have migrated for millions of years. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I feel like I'm going to be really terrible now and <laughs> forget everybody. Um, so maybe it's better if I like sent you a list later. But in terms of specific voices, I mean, I feel like I hear them all the time, but that's because the work that I'm doing. Um, yeah, I, I know a lot of people who are talking up on it. It just depends. Do you mean in a politics sense or like a policy sense or like journalists or um, I always think like, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Um, sorry. Yeah, we can get to go to another question and then maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I don't yeah. know, because also journalistically, I'm not really supposed to say like I agree with this person, I agree with that person. Like I always have to be a little bit careful in terms of you know objectivity. So if I say like I, you know, you should elevate this person and then you know, I can, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can have a discussion after because um, I'm just, yeah, like I said, I'm like a bit conscious of not like promoting a certain, uh, a certain organization or a certain voice. But I mean, gen on a general level, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I talked earlier about the importance of like questioning language and framing all the time, but also like, there's, yeah, like looking at which voices are being listened to has been like a big part of my work and my kind of realization as well that things are so problematic. And like, you know, one of the ironies of doing this type of work is that I've ended up a lot of times in Brussels, for example, in discussions, you know, with politicians and for example, like everybody will be wise generally or like everybody will be um from specific viewpoints and there's always this very horrible thing as well that's like you know you're sitting in a very comfortable room effectively discussing can people live or die and the last event they asked me to speak in brussels in november at the eu parliament the ombudsman conference and um one of the translators actually spoke up and said you know there's no sense of urgency here like i don't understand why um, yeah, like they said, I think it was two separate people. One said there's no sense of urgency and one said he was finding it very upsetting to come to work because the debate just seems so removed from like the actual realities of people. And yeah, I mean, people of different backgrounds, like even, yeah, I, th I think just, to just looking at like, not just racially, but like the diversity of voices, the, the backgrounds of people, the experiences of people, there needs to be like a general widening of that discussion. And I'm always like really conscious, by the way, I'm saying this as like a privileged white European woman, like, like one of the things that I talk about in the book that I tried to do is like get op-eds published by people who were in detention. Um, I work with like various groups that are kind of 
helping people write um, their experiences and uh, also like exiled journalists getting into media in the UK because that's where I live for much longer than here. Um, so journalists who have been exiled from their own countries. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's really a problem and yeah, we all need to be kind of questioning questioning the voices. And by the way, if you're talking about what you see in Irish media, I think Irish media is so terrible at international coverage. Like, and I say that as an employee of Irish media. Um, it's really, really bad. And like the Irish Times, I think, is the best. Um, we do invest in it, but generally it's very poor. And I don't know why that isn't brought up and questioned a lot more. For example, RTE right now, as far as I know, has no Africa correspondence. They have no one like assigned just to cover Africa and I think that's such a problem it's a co continent of like 1.4 billion people like you know we're having these debates over xenophobia you know why are people coming here blah blah and you don't even have someone designated to cover like this huge continent which is obviously so varied and so many countries and so many different things happening and you know couldn't you have like one person that's covering that they did have one correspondent I think but now um, she's left and she was hired under a DFA funded scheme from what I know um, so that wasn't you know that was like a limited uh, uh, you know a limited period of funding anyway I don't think I answered that very well but no, <laughs> sorry I'm also quite tired <laughs> well, you can talk later as well so <laughs> um, any other yes I see one there yeah um, Anna if you just just there yeah uh, yeah uh, thanks, uh, Ushi Maxweeney, uh, Chair of the Economic Society in UCC. Um, from your time reporting on the effects of the problems um, in countries forcing the migration to occur, uh, is there anything you think will fix the problems? Is there any stories coming up that you might be able to report on that will fix the problems in the, the countries causing migration? Or that will, there, will that ever happen? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, like, I think the biggest problem is like global inequality. And I don't say that just as financial, like global inequality as to access to rights, access to movement, access to, you know, climate change, for example, like the West is producing huge amounts of emissions and Africa is producing, I think the latest is 3.5% or something. It was at 1.2% of global emissions. And yet, like many African countries, are suffering hugely from climate change, um, lack of opportunities. It's very hard, like like simple things, like like talking to friends in Nigeria, for example, and they're like, we don't have social welfare, we don't have accessible, you know, if if some if we fall on hard times and we need we need help, we can't get that from our state, or you know, if you can, it's very very limited. And we in Ireland kind of take those things for granted to a certain extent, and particularly like passport, you know, having a powerful passport is so valuable. You have a powerful passport, you can still live in, you know, your home country, but you can, you at least have the freedom. If something goes bad, you can move out of it. Whereas like the loops that people have to go through right now to try and get into Europe, you know, Ugandan friends who have had, uh, you know, I'm thinking of like musicians, for example, who have gigs confirmed in the UK and, they have, like, you know, they have contracts, everything is set up, everything is legal, and they apply for the visa, and the whole process is so expensive and humiliating. Um, whereas if you have a powerful passport, you know, I've heard someone when I lived in Sierra Leone be like, do you even need a visa to come here? It's like, we have the freedom to move around. And when I was um, reporting this book, actually, I moved to Uganda, uh, basically as an economic migrant, because London was too expensive for me, and I was trying to be able to focus on this work and I was freelance and um, I could live in Uganda for less money and I got offered work from the Irish Times and like the irony is not lost on me like I can go there as an economic migrant you know quite freely whereas like people you know suddenly if you're trying to come the other way it's like so evil and wrong and at the same stage we're extracting basically like you know, a lot of medical workers from a lot of these countries, we're giving, we're doing, you know, we're enabling a brain drain in a certain sense. Um, so I think that there's a lot of factors at play there, but yeah, more of an acknowledgement of the fact that we live in kind of a, a system of global inequality is, you know, really important for actually understanding why all of this is happening and, and the value placed on certain lives above others, the, the 
you know, the rights given to certain people, like we can see in Gaza now, for example, what is happening to people. And um, if you had been born in Gaza, you're just born there by the chance of your birth. You know, you could be born anywhere in the world. It's, it's very, you know, random. <laughs> like, so, but yeah, that's, it, it totally depends, like whether you'll be safe and your family will be safe. And um, if you were in Gaza and you had a foreign passport, you get, you know, you have the chance to leave quite early. And if you were in Sudan and, you know, the EU embassies evacuated their staff and actually destroyed a load of Sudanese passports that they were holding for visa applications. Um, one of my friends, his passport was taken by the Swedish embassy and he didn't get it back. And so he's Sudanese and he's suddenly trapped in Sudan with no passport, even though a Sudanese passport won't give you much um, rights anyway. But... Yeah, it just shows again the, the value placed on some lives compared to others and who has power and who has wealth and um, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Well, um, I think I saw a question somewhere here before. I saw a hand just, um, though I don't want to ignore anyone, but if not, then there was definitely yeah, someone down there as well. <laughs> uh, testing, testing. Um, so you mentioned before your work being used against the German government and uh, to some extent being misused by the British government to paint uh, Rwanda as being safer than it actually was. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for how you think your work should be used at different levels? Like, I admit I'm not in the area at all. I'm just a random guy who uh, occasionally goes door to door and uh, t trying to debunk racist propaganda and whatnot. Do you think your work is useful in that area? And um, are there other uses that you could think of that I can't? Yeah, um, my, sorry, maybe I explained that badly. So it wasn't used by the British government. It was actually used in the legal challenge against them. So the lawyers who were saying that the deportations shouldn't happen were the ones who submitted. Um, I basically had to sign like a witness statement that just outlined like what I had experienced. And I, you know, they submit that as, um, as expert evidence or something like that. Um, yeah. I, uh, how should my work be used? I'm always like so anxious about this because I think you can never predict consequences. And to be honest, like the vast, vast majority of time, there are no consequences. And like when I started out, I'd be like, you know, if people only knew about this, everything would change. And I realized quite quickly that you can't, that probably it won't change, but also you can't necessarily predict what might happen as a result of it and you know i've had some of my work used or referenced by like kind of right-wing groups like my investigation into corruption and in the un hcr resettlement scheme that was you know referenced by right-wing groups i can't remember actually what they were using it for but i remember being told that um that they had kind of i don't know made some point out of it and uh, yeah, I just think as a journalist, you have to report what you see. And I really, really believe in the value of accurate information. I think I've been in enough situations where if some something can happen and just not get reported and nobody knows about it, like, I think there's, before I became a journalist, I thought things just get reported and that's the way it is. And actually now I'm like, no, if they don't get reported, they might as well not exist for like a lot of people, you know, like they're, the people who went through them even might be like, this happened and no one will believe them. Um, and yeah, whereas your role as a journalist is to really just make sure that there's a documentation, make sure, you know, sometimes that no one can say they don't know, but even if they can say they don't know, at least it's in a article or it's in, you know, a news report or whatever somewhere. And so in terms of consequences, I gave up a long time ago thinking that, it leads to great change, but I have with this book, it's been very interesting that people have reached out to me. It hasn't all been like policy people. I mean, I've heard from a lot of staff in the EU, people who are very comfortable with, uncomfortable with the way things are at the moment, people who are very grateful that it's being reported, you know, but can't speak themselves because of their jobs or that's what they say anyway. Um, and uh, but at the same stage, I've also heard, for example, from medics or people who work with refugees in different countries who will say, you know, I didn't know what it means when someone tells me like their eyes don't work well because they've been in, a, in Libya. Now I know like they could have been locked in a detention center with no sunlight for months. And maybe that's what they mean. And that's been kind of like a good consequence, I would say. Consequence is the wrong word, but like a good a good thing. Maybe it's bringing more awareness so that person doesn't actually have to explain what they've been through in all cases, but 
there can still be that understanding that um, this is real. And I think one thing, sorry to, and like one thing is that um, a lot of people who've gone through these journeys, like I documented at the end of the book, they'll get to a country like there's one, there's two people I sat with in Sweden in a restaurant and they were like, we're so amazed by like how well people treat their dogs here. Like they're, the way that they treat their pets when, when humans are being so abused on the borders. And yet, you know, we see these really pampered dogs and then what we started, you know, they started reminiscing about, reminiscing is again, probably the wrong word, but they started like remembering what it was like in detention. And one of them kind of started crying and I was like, like, we don't have to talk about this, you know, we can talk about something else. And he was like, actually, I want to talk about it because I feel like nobody here even believes that this is real. They don't understand that this is happening. They don't live in a world where they can comprehend that this is the reality for many people. And it's good for me to finally be able to talk because like to a Swedish person, I would never mention this. And there was another person who was in a hospital actually getting medical treatment and he got asked, I think the nurse or a doctor said, you know, here is the instructions for what you should do. And he said, can you write it down? Because I have like a really bad memory because of, uh, he started, she, she said like, why do you have a bad memory? And he started explaining he had been through a lot of trauma, what had happened to him in Libya. Um, and one, I'm sure people know, like one impact of trauma is that your memory can be quite affected. And he said, uh, he told her this and she goes, oh my God, it's like a movie. And he was like, imagine that's the reaction if you actually tell people what's happening. So um, in terms of my work, I think, yeah, I, I just felt like nobody, no Europeans should be able to say they don't know about this. Like this is happening in our name. This is our money that's paying for this. This is our policy. And this is what we're enabling when we enable the kind of, you know, xenophobic racist rhetoric to perpetrate um, or like the political kind of, discourse, the, the way that, you know, the way that certain things are put forward or phrases, even the use of the term migration management, when we don't challenge, like, does that mean you're locking people up indefinitely in detention centers where potential crimes against humanity are taking place? Like, like, think about that when you hear someone use that term migration management. So I hope that's a consequence of my work. But in terms of actual change, I don't. And the legal stuff is very weird. Like, you're I was a bit like, when they asked me to go to Berlin and testify, I was like, I don't know that I'm supposed to do this as a journalist. It's a bit strange, like, when do you become involved and when don't you? And with the Rwanda, once they used my reporting in the Rwanda challenge, I stopped reporting on the deportation, you know, the UK scheme, because I was like, now, I guess, technically, I'm kind of a player in this in a weird way. But um, when I was going to Rwanda, I was trying to do something else. It wasn't related to that. but. Then I did write a piece because the Irish Times asked me to about being banned from Rwanda, but I did say that it was used in the legal case. But but yeah, as a journalist, you're not really meant to be a player. So once you become like a, you know, once you become involved in some way, you either have to declare that or kind of step away. I think. Mm. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll check the time there. I, I think we'll do one more question, and then we may actually have to wrap up because we're over time already. But um, is there any other question? Um, anyone else? Yeah, I see. Yeah. There no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eddie, and thank you very much for this wonderful talk and for the great work that you've been doing. I would just like to ask, uh, what do you think can be done to amplify more voices like yours? And then also, ultimately, like, what do you think might be the solution to this uh, migration crisis? Like, what should be done for us to address this migration crisis? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, like, I don't really want my voice to be amplified at all because I'm feeling like I wrote, like, it's kind of complicated. Like, I, 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 like, I wrote, reported because I thought that was important. And I wrote the book because I wanted there to be all of this evidence that I had gathered to exist. And then when the book came out, I realized, you know, the night that it came out, I was thinking at midnight. I, like, I couldn't sleep. I was terrified. I was like, it's going to be out in the world. Everybody will know this is true. And, you know, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And then, uh, like, a month passed, and they send you kind of your initial sales figures. And this is not, by the way, about commercial, but, like, in terms of how many people are actually reading the book, it was so low <laughs> that I was like, oh, okay, I think I personally know all of those people, and they're my family <laughs> members. So... Um, at that point, I kind of realized, well, like, 
how can I make people actually read the book? And I was asked, getting asked to do events. So I was like, okay, I should probably do the events to, you know, actually get people to read the book basically. But like, I never had the aim of me being a speaker. I'm like, you should have seen me now. I'm a bit better, but like at the very beginning, like my voice would be shaking so much. I'd be not making any sense whatsoever. And like, I was really, really nervous and just, yeah, I had no, I've, I don't have that much interest in being like a public person. Like, I mean, you can see when someone takes my photo, I'm like, <laughs> so yeah, I find that whole aspect terrifying. Um, and at the same stage, it's helpful to have people saying these things, I think. And for me, like, I know that a lot of the people who gave me information, they don't want to be the ones speaking for, for many different reasons. Like, they feel like, you know, they're moving on with their lives now. Um, they don't want it to be constantly that they have to talk about this very traumatic time. A lot, some of it is security issues as well. Sometimes they don't want, often actually, they don't want their family members to know what they've been through. So they'll have been lying to their family members all the way along and saying, everything is great, not to worry, you know, I've eaten like a really massive plate of whatever it is. And, you know, I'm very happy when the reality is very different and... Yeah, so for those reasons, obviously, it can be helpful if I'm the one talking about it. But I do question how much, you know, how much good it is for um, me to be speaking. And yeah, I think I think the more voices, the better, basically, on this. Um, the more people talking. There is one guy who, uh, Yambio David, he's called, and he came through Libya. And he's set up a, a Twitter account called Refugees in Libya. And he's also trying to find more voices too. But he's been going around talking a lot about what's going on. Um, and he's also collecting a lot of information. And that's good. And even to him, we were, I was talking to him and he was like, you know, we were both saying, like, it shouldn't be just you. It needs to be more people. Like, the more, the better. Um, so, yeah, what can be done to help them? I think, I think, I mean, I don't know who here has powerful positions, but like inviting people to speak, looking for people, elevating voices, getting people published, um, giving people encouragement about what they have to say, not just making it like if there's someone who's been through this type of journey, not making it that they just have to talk about their experience, but like what they think the policies should be, what they think the answers are, or what they think would help. Um, and in terms of your second question, uh, and, we, and we did that, by the way, we did a story like, oh, I forgot to answer that part of your question about Rwanda and people who might be deported to Rwanda. In the Irish Times, I got them recently to publish an op-ed by somebody in the UK, an Eritrean guy who is at risk of being sent to Rwanda. And I thought that was really important because he gets to say exactly what he wants to say without it all being filtered through me. Um, we put that in the opinion pages, but it had to go under a fake name and they thankfully agreed to do that. Um, and yeah, how do we solve the migration crisis? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just think, I think there's many different, like Europe is obviously becoming more, it's quite scary at the moment. Um, and I think one of the things that I've noticed, like even before the last election, I was still reporting on this same topic um, it's in the book, actually, when the EU declared the migration crisis over ahead of the European elections in 2019. Um, I think that European officials are using a lot. They're saying we don't want the far right to get in power, and therefore we're increasingly imposing much, much more abusive policies because that's what the European public want and because we don't want the far right to get in power. And I have to question like at what point do the center right become the far right in terms of particularly the migration policy i think again that framing of like oh the center won again is like problematic because i mean read the book and ask yourself is this not far right you know migration policy um and yeah i guess for me i'm a journalist i believe in facts i think the first thing if you're making any policy I can't solve it myself and I'm also never suggest policy because I work as a journalist you're not really meant to do that but I do think how can we create any policy without actually understanding what the situation is right now and if we're living in a state where you know the current situation is being denied or covered up or voices are being silenced or um, yeah, we're not actually facing up to the consequences of what we've already done, then how can you make new policy? And until that's actually done, I think, you know, anything that goes forward on the basis of the kind of flawed 
framing that we have now is, is going to be a problematic. Thank you so much, Sally. I think I definitely learned a lot. Uh, I hope you all did as well. I would suggest strongly that you read the book, not just as advertising for you, but because um, there's so much information in it that we weren't able to talk about today. And it really gives you good insight um, and kind of the truth of what is actually happening, because I feel like it's very easy to um, be fed lies. Um, so I'm going to say thank you so much, Sally, to you for coming. To you. Yeah, no. Thanks for um, your first you well, yeah. Uh, you said um, that. Uh, well, I was just thinking when you were talking there that um, I mean, this institute is a great example of someone who can host um, people and amplify voices. So we will definitely try and do that in the future. Um, so I think let's just give a big round of applause.